Okay. Uh, well, I might call call a session to order. It's 1101. Uh, welcome, everyone, to episode two of our Regional Sustainable Development Partnership Natural Resource Webinar Series. Um, I'm Rose Clark. Uh, I'm an AmeriCorps volunteer with working with Linda Kingry in the Northwest and the natural resource groups throughout the state in the RSDPs. Um, I think most of you already know what uh, the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships do, but just a quick little summary. Um, they connect uh, communities of greater Minnesota to university resources as part of University of Minnesota Extension. Um, and that can be through funding uh, and, and ideally through also um, people partnerships as well. Uh, students and faculty and researchers helping solve issues in the larger communities. Um, so welcome to WebEx if you're joining us online. Um, hopefully you have figured out the uh, audio portion. And um, if you need anything, refer back to that chat box on the right-hand side. Uh, you can submit questions there for the panelists um, or for me. And, and I will pass them on um, when we have a chance to answer some questions. Um, at the end of the time, I'll, I'll be doing a little poll as part of my Serve Minnesota um, requirements. So be looking for that, and, and please let me know uh, how things went for you, what you learned. Um, when you close the page, uh, another poll should pop up, and that can also be found on the um, webinar home site. Uh, which I'll show you how to get there from our RSVP webpage. Um, you should be seeing the RSVP website. Um, if you scroll down, you will see uh, a link to the Natural Resource Issues um, webinar series. We're in episode two here, Hazelnuts and Landscapes. And this is where you'll find links to um, things that Dean and Amanda refer to today in their webinar. Uh, you'll also find a recording of this webinar uh, for future reference or if you want to pass it on. Um, and then there will also be a link to a more extensive um, uh, post-webinar poll um, for me to gather info on what is useful to you guys, what um, is our challenges to this kind of format. Um, so. That will be uh, available at the end. I'd really appreciate if you gave me your feedback. Um, let's see. Oh, this session is being recorded, as I said, so you can find it later um, and pass it on. Um, so this webinar series is is to better acquaint people throughout the region, the so work group members and staff people, um, with what's going on in different regions and also with what's going on in the university in, uh, in regards to natural resources and the things that we're doing. So today we're featuring um, for our university component, um, Dean Current with SINRAM uh, and Amanda Sames um, also working with SINRAM uh, but on a RSDP and Mary Page Fund sponsored project. Um, so we'll be hearing more about what the work that they're doing and trying to um, understand what resources are available to us and also celebrate the things that we're working on. So um, with that, Dean, I will pass the ball over to you and introduce you a little bit. Um, so Dean Current is the Research Associate and Director for the Center of Integrated Natural Resource and Agricultural Management, also known as SINRAM. Um, and yeah, Dean, can I give us a little um, summary of what you're working on? Great. Well, thanks, Rose. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. This is a great effort. I appreciate you doing it, Rose. And uh, it's good to always get out and, and communicate with others about what we're doing. Um, and uh, so I manage the Center for Integrated Natural Resources and Agricultural Management. This uh, was actually set up by a couple of graduate students back in the 90s uh, and has grown from there. Um, Don Wise has been involved, Ken Brooks here in, in forest resources as well. But it's uh, an interdisciplinary partner-based center with a lot of similar objectives to the uh, sustainable uh, renewable development efforts. 
So we are a partner-based organization, and uh, we like to think we catalyze the development and adoption of integrated land use systems, uh, linking the expertise of the University of Minnesota with the experience and insights of people and organizations who work with and have understanding of opportunities and issues across the landscape. And we like to say that everyone's an expert. Uh, we bring certain things to the table, being at the university with our research, but folks living out in the landscape are the experts on what works out there. So, uh, so the partnership is very important to us to really come up with what we hope will be practical solutions. So what we're trying to move towards is uh, a more diversified agricultural and natural resource production base. Uh, increased profitability uh, for farmers and support for communities, uh, an enhanced environment, you know, through our efforts, strengthening rural communities, looking at enterprise development, um, and really productive landscapes that generate income at the same time that they're providing environmental and ecosystem services. So our focus is that production rather than uh, trying to say, hands off certain areas, looking at ways we can uh, produce things at the same time that um, we generate those important environmental and ecosystem services. Um, I think some of our comparative advantages, uh, we are really linking agriculture and natural resource management, and we have to look at both. I mean, agriculture is a very important uh, part of our, our, our state's economy and uh, very productive. But we like to look at how we do that integrated management with that important resource, but also looking at the natural resources and impacts and, and trying to, to improve our management. So we're talking about working in um, agricultural dominated landscapes in southern Minnesota and forest dominated landscapes in, in north, northeast Minnesota and really to the extent that we can integrating food and fiber production, whether it be for bioenergy, uh, wood products, uh, and then obviously the, the important food crops in the state. And agroforestry has always been an important part of our work, and agroforestry really refers in, in general terms to uh, really mixing trees and crops on the landscape and through that um, that mixing uh, and kind of the synergistic effects really having a more productive landscape, both in terms of uh, production of crops and income, but also the, the environmental services. Uh, we like to think we have a strong outstate presence. We work with a lot of partners throughout the state. A lot of our work is concentrated, concentrated in south central Minnesota. And really, you know, going back to what we, we like to say the university is doing, and that is solution driven science. We're looking really at applied research to address some of the, the, the issues that we're facing. Um, we have a lot of different types of partners. You know, university-wide, we are an interdisciplinary center. Um, we work with the research and, out, research and outreach centers, the regional sustainable development partnerships, and others as uh, our interests coincide. Uh, we work a lot with state and federal government agencies. Uh, as we know, you know, they have uh, a lot of impact in what happens on the landscape. So they're important partners as we look uh, at how we can improve management of our natural resources in the agricultural landscapes. We work with uh, a lot of NGOs. Rural Advantage has been a very important partner for us for many years. We do a lot of work down around Fairmont Mont in, in Martin County. Uh, farmer organizations, we work with the private sector, we've worked with Farrar Malting on biomass for energy, Golder Associates is an engineering firm that looks at renewable energy as well, we worked with one of their engineers. Uh, Continental Floral Greens and Hermes Florals, I'll mention a little later, we work with communities in Guatemala and Mexico that harvest palms and sell them into the U.S. floral market. and. Really the same approach there is looking at how we can uh, generate income for those communities while we uh, uh, protect and conserve important natural resources, uh, tropical forests and biosphere reserves in, in that case. We work with the tribal and community colleges and internationally we uh, work with Katia in Costa Rica, a large institution that works on agricultural and natu natural resource management issues throughout Latin America. Rainforest Alliance uh, in our inter international work in Latin America, 
And then we've been working recently uh, with Missouri University in Northeast India, a tribal region of India, looking at their land use issues and how they can be, that management can be improved and while well, generating, you know, opportunities for the communities in that part of the world. Um, so really, you know, we're looking at uh, improving land management and promoting more sustainable systems and looking for opportunities in Minnesota's agriculture and forest sectors. So, you know, one of our approaches, uh, and I'm sure you've all talked about this, is, you know, multifunctional landscapes. So, uh, can we and how can we produce biomass for a range of uses while providing environmental ecological services? And that has been a you know, major focus of, of our work. We really started out looking at, at water quality. And when we saw you know, this whole initiative uh, in terms of promoting more renewable energy, we looked at that as really a great opportunity to uh, potentially introduce more perennials on the landscape, which is a focus of our work, um, working with Greenlands, Blue Waters, and Forever Green um, for production of biomass for energy. Um, we do a lot of things on a smaller scale. The impact isn't as great. If we could convert large areas to perennials for biomass for energy, we thought you know that's that could have a a significant imp impact on water quality as well as the, the other types of services, the carbon sequestration, water quality improvement, wildlife habitat, recreation, and uh, a number of, of other benefits. So we take an integrated approach. Uh, some, uh, we do a lot of work looking at hydrology, look, modeling the impact of perennial crops and agroforestry systems on water quality and storage. Um, agronomy, the production of these perennial crops. We know that uh, billions, probably more, has been spent on corn and soybean research, uh, but a lot of the perennial crops that we'd like to see on the landscape have had very little investment in uh, agronomic practices to improve productivity, profitability, and you know, the diversity that we want from these systems. Uh, economics, you know, always an important driver, driver. We know that farmers have to make a living. They have to put their kids through school, plan for retirement. Uh, so uh, look at the financial costs and benefits of these different crops, uh, the econ economic impacts uh, of crops, and the potential for payments for environmental services, which uh, will increase the profitability of these crops we'd like to see on the landscape. And then also, enterprise development, uh, you know, a good example of that right now is looking at, you know, the effort with Kernza uh, through Forever Green, uh, where we're moving some of these perennial crops into the market and looking at how we set up people to produce for that market. And a lot of our international work has also um, concentrated on that, looking at how we can generate income for communities. Uh, and improve livelihoods. Uh, and then the outreach, the social piece, uh, looking at stakeholder processes, adoption issues. Uh, we know that we've been promoting a lot of these systems conservation practices for year, but years, but um, you know, the op adoption isn't necessarily there. Uh, same thing is true for agroforestry, that uh, we really need to look at what it takes to change people's minds and get them to try some of these things. And part of that uh, is the policy options, you know, looking at uh, how policies impact what happens on the landscape and how we can introduce policies at, at whatever level that will facilitate the adoption of some of the, the practices we'd like to see on the landscape. Um, a lot of our work has been concentrated in Minnesota, in the upper Mississippi River basins, uh, southern Minnesota, uh, and again, looking at the perennials and agroforestry systems for water quality, looking at how we can target those plantings for maximum environmental benefits. You know, where can we put them on the landscape so they provide corridors for wildlife, so that they're in the problem spots that uh, they're taking up the nutrients before they hit our, our, our water courses in the state. But again, uh, looking at how we can be more effective when we make these changes on the landscape. 
Um, and again, the research uh, here has been looking at impacts of the perennials and agroforestry and water quality and storage. Some research on total maximum daily loads, how they can be addressed, uh, the development of these perennial crops, the agronomy economics and enterprise development um, that I mentioned, and, and again, working closely with Greenlands, Blue Waters, and the uh, Forever Green initiative. So if we look at, you know, again, our integrated approach, uh, you know, how do we make these systems work? We do have to look at uh, policies and supportive policies for the things that we're promoting. Markets are, can be an extremely important um, driver of any landscape change, so they're, they're also important. The biophysical research, again, going back to really knowing how to grow these crops and make them work and recognizing that, uh, you know, for farmers, it's, it's risky trying some of these new crops they haven't planted before. They know how to do corn and soybeans, uh, but we really need, really need the research to help them, uh, you know, understand how to produce these crops and do it successfully uh, so it does contribute to their livelihoods. And that's, you know, part of, you know, we really need to look at landowner adoption. What are the constraints that they face? And, how can we address those? And those constraints might be the policy, might be markets, might be the biophysical research, um, but we need to know what those constraints are and then work to overcome them. And obviously, again, with the, the landowner adoption, extension and outreach, uh, and you know the partnerships can be, a, a, or have been a great partner in much of that work. And so really, it's, Again, looking at how we integrate these, these different factors and really come up with options for more sustainable and, and productive landscapes. And we need all the pieces. And so we, in our research, try and identify, you know, where the need is and, and find the, the funding to, to address some of these issues. So some of the potential drivers of landscape change we've looked at, again, as I mentioned earlier, renewable energy. It has been one, although because of our, our low gas prices now, that has kind of, that hasn't been as effective as we'd hoped. There are still, you know, quite a few efforts uh, looking at renewable energy. There's <clears throat> funding from the federal government uh, and, and still an interest, but uh, it would probably be a little while before that really takes off. Uh, carbon capture and storage, you know, uh, with climate change, uh, uh, really rising to the surface now, things could happen there, and that could be an important source of uh, additional support for some of the things that we do. Um, the water quality concerns, you know, the, the Governor's Summit, and, uh, you know, a lot of our efforts were highlighted during that summit. So we have a real, uh, and, and the buffer law as well, we have a real opportunity right now to take some of the work we've done and move it into uh, into practice through some of those efforts at the state level. Uh, inf interest in habitat improvement and, you know, the, the buffer law started out with a meeting that Dayton went to with Pheasants Forever. So there are a lot of interest in the state, people interested in wildlife, um, and they have a pretty significant impact on, on what happens policy-wise. And, uh, and, but we, at the same time, we want that habitat. And uh, so it's, it's kind of looking at, you know, how do we take advantage of those opportunities to, to really get the, the, the landscape change. And again, the, the market drivers there, biofuels, again, uh, not as fast as we'd hope, but still something that, that is out there uh, maybe in the future. And then uh, the payments for environmental services. Uh, again, with climate change, we could see things happening with carbon. Uh, with water quality um, that uh, is going to support, you know, the, these changes we'd like to see. And then there's other things like hunting leases and ecotourism that different folks around the university are working on. So again, you know, one of our real um, challenges is looking at, you know, how do we work with landowners? How do we get them to convert to perennial systems, and it, it has to make sense financially uh, that a lot of people interested in um, 
you know, improving the environment, but uh, again, they have to make a living. So we say when we look at these perennial systems, they must be competitive. It might take the payments for environmental services to do that, but you know, we need to look at that and see what it is uh, going to take. And in terms of you know the benefits, uh, it often has to be more than competitive. It might have to be a little bit better, and that being a little bit better might even be the, the environmental benefits. But again, uh, you know, these farmers we know are uh, are adopting things that are risky for them. They don't have the government support network that we do have with commodity uh, crops. If they lose a crop, they lose it. They they don't always have insurance. There's been movements in that direction, but again, it is it is an issue. Um, again, the bioenergy crops are still not competitive. There's been a lot of improvements there, but uh, we're still not there, again, given the, the petroleum prices. And as I mentioned already, we look at the payments for ecosystem services as potentially being able to, uh, to really make the difference there and maybe help convince people to try some of these options. So, uh, and then when we look at, you know, landowners, we know that's not a homogeneous group. So we look at different things for different people. So one of the things we worked on in the past and continue to work on are decorative woody florals. These are um, uh, things like willows, uh, dogwood, you know, decorative stems. And there's a, a good market for those. Uh, and we've talked to florists, uh, any wholesalers in the cities, and they say they'll they'll buy these out of the back of somebody's pickup truck if somebody shows up at their their warehouse. But in other places, in Nebraska, they've organized a cooperative to produce those. These are um, you know fairly labor intensive crops. So this is probably for someone that has you know you know 50, 100, 200 acres um, that's willing to to put in uh, really put their labor into that effort. Um, so it's and some of the uh, you know, the new people moving out that don't have a lot of land, that could be an option. Um, hazelnuts, which, you know, Amanda will be talking about, uh, that's a crop that you could have on larger acreages, you know, 50 to 100, maybe 200 acres. Um, and with, you know, the mechanical harvesting now, that becomes easier to manage on, on a larger scale. Um, but, you know, obviously probably not on the 2,000 to 10,000 acre farms that are out there. And so for those light, larger acreages, um, again, we are looking at some of the, the biomass for energy crops, the perennial grasses <clears throat> are some of the woody species uh, that really the systems have been developed to the point where they're very similar to agricultural production. So you could think about larger areas uh, in these, these different species. So, but again, uh, I guess the point here is that we do have lift different types of landowners out there and they're going to have different interests and we need options uh, for the for different types of, of land holdings. Um, so uh, again, the activities and issues that I've been talking about, uh, the Minnesota Upper Mississippi River Basin, looking at perennial plants for water quality and storage, the biomass for energy and bioproducts. Um, forest management and biomass, we've done some work in northeastern Minnesota. And then the international work looking at watershed management, uh, community forestry has been a, a focus of that and markets uh, for conservation. Um, international activities, we have study abroad programs uh, uh, for students uh, and getting faculty involved overseas. Uh, we are creating opportunities for students. Actually, Amanda might be doing some work with us in Mexico and uh, Guatemala related to uh, some of the work that uh, Main Street Project has been doing in Northfield. Um, we do a lot of work looking at the, the research on impacts of community forestry where governments have turned over land to communities to manage and generate uh, wood products and non-timber forest products uh, to support their livelihoods, the sustainable land use, and then again, enterprise development. So if we have these crops, uh, how will they be produced, aggregated through an ag co-op? What might be the best route to do that? So uh, 
uh, people can get involved with those those crops and and improve their livelihoods. Uh, some of the partnering opportunities that we have, um, we work with MDA producer grants, uh, working with landowners. Uh, we work with undergraduate students that get research funding to do things. It's, it's something that provides money to our undergraduate students to do a research project supported by a faculty member, and that could be done anywhere. Um, uh, the partnership funding, we had an interesting project with Kent Share up in Wadena with the Central uh, uh, Partnership. Uh, this was when we had an active market in Chicago for payments for carbon sequestration and Kent, this was actually his idea was to come up with a landowner guide um, for engaging in that market and we put that together and uh, very successful. It actually was copied by states. I had people contact me from around the country that were interested in that and, and, and doing something similar. Uh, unfortunately, that market is no longer there, but uh, we still do have that could be brought back uh, once that market develops again. Uh, Project-based collaboration, we work with farmers, communities in a lot of our projects, uh, and we would jointly write a project and then engaging graduate students like uh, Amanda. And then uh, last thing I just wanted to mention in the enterprise development, uh, since we're kind of in the season, we've been working with these communities in, in Guatemala and Mexico that produce palms for the, the floral market, and they're the palms that are used for Palm Sunday. So uh, we've been able to work with them and with uh, the importer in Texas, uh, the wholesalers uh, around the U.S., to develop kind of a fair trade palm uh, program where uh, churches that purchase the palms uh, for Palm Sunday uh, can purchase palm that have been produced uh, using sustainable practices that are certified as sustainable uh, and support livelihoods in the communities where these palms come from. So they pay an extra five cents per frond or per stem and that money goes directly back to the communities. And we've worked with church organizations, their national headquarters, to promote this. And so this year we sold about a million fronds, and that's sending about $50,000 back to these communities, which uh, they invest in scholarships, community improvement, um, a pension fund for some of the palm gatherers. Uh, but that's, you know, again, part of what we look at, you know, how do we develop these markets, uh, niche markets in some cases, that help support both conservation um, and livelihood improvement. In the case of those communities, they're living in bio, important biosphere reserve forests, and they're protecting the forest as they sustainably harvest this palm, which they, they harvest from, from the wild. But, uh, you know, it's a model we want, to, we like to use everywhere, including here in Minnesota. So, and I guess questions will come later. Is that right, Rose? Um, I actually, if if you wouldn't mind, um, I have a couple that <laughs> questions. Oh, I think sure. I haven't seen any on the board, but um, you you mentioned that that there's a risk in taking on these new markets um, that are kind of developing. But um, I was wondering if there's if there's a safety net. Um, or a model of a safety net that farmers could count on um, as they're making the changes? Yeah, that, that's a good question, and I, I guess I don't have a real good answer. I think, you know, we have seen, you know, for some of the specialty crops that they are uh, looking at insurance. Um, and I guess the other thing is just, uh, you know, what a, a farmer might be able to work out with a, uh, someone purchasing these products that, that was interested in supporting, uh, you know, the farmers and, and really maintaining that supply. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and then my other question was, are, are there any specific opportunities that you have on your radar um, that you see, uh, you know, for RSDP or other community members or groups to support FINRAM efforts um, at this time? Yeah, I think, you know, we're always looking for partners. Um, one of the things, you know, we're hoping to do some work with is the, the new buffer law. Um, 
So looking at how we can, uh, we've done a lot of work on these different practices to really address water quality issues. And um, we're interested in really taking that research and moving it into the process of, of rolling out the, the buffer law and working with, you know, groups in communities with farmers to, to find practices that work with them and also, you know, provide the, the protection that, that we're interested in. So, you know, we look for, you know, things like the MDA uh, producer grants. Uh, if I'm sure, you know, the, the partnerships know people out there, like Ken Share, that, that we could work with. That's always valuable information. Awesome. Thank you. I, I love this little sound bite that you said. Um, you're developing markets to support conservation and livelihood. I feel like that's really powerful. So, thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Yeah, um, so we'll, we'll pass the ball over to Amanda. Um, Amanda Seams is a graduate student working with SINRAM, um, specifically on a, on a hazelnut project. Um, she's going to be telling us a little bit more about that. All right, thanks, Rose. Um, I'm going to ask you all to be a bit patient with me. I've got a bit of a cold, so if my voice gets real scratchy, um, but yeah, so I'm going to talk about hazelnuts and some of the work on hazelnut industry development that I've been able to do that's supported by the RSDPs. And um, in large part, the, the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships kind of got interested in hazelnuts at a statewide level because of folks in the southwest and southeast kind of bringing bringing the concept forward and, and saying that there might be some potential here, um, especially since the development of cold hardy hybrids. Most of the hazelnuts in the U.S. are, are produced out on the West Coast in Oregon, um, and they're the European variety of hazelnuts. They grow more like a tree. What we can grow here in the Midwest is more like a shrub and much more similar to what you would find with Corliss Americana if you went out into the woods throughout much of Minnesota. Um, so these hybrids do a couple of great things. They provide cold hardiness and disease resistance to eastern filbert blight. Um, and that comes through from the wild genetics. But we're also trying to work in, or at least some folks are trying to work in some of the European genetics to produce bigger nuts that are easier to crack um, and might be more attractive in a marketplace. So the reason we're really interested in doing some of this is that hazelnuts have quite a bit of potential to help diversify the agricultural landscape and protect soil and water resources as a perennial crop um, and one that we're looking at as hopefully having a, a high cash value once we can get a market established. Uh, so I was brought on through a grant or a scholarship from the Mary J. Page Community Leadership Fund and that was established, I was the first recipient of funding and that was in um, January of 2015 when I got that, that grant. Mary Page, most of you on, on this webinar probably have some familiarity with her, but she was one of the founders of the West Central RSDPs and um, was a statewide leader for the partnerships, a regent at the University of Minnesota. She was a county commissioner and a mayor. She was deeply, deeply engaged in supporting Minnesota rural communities. And when she passed away in 2013, that prompted her family to create the endowment that is now the Mary Page Community University Partnership Fund. Uh, and that fund goes to help support graduate students and students at the U who might be conducting research on projects that are really community-based, um, things that kind of come up from the communities through the regional partnerships um, where they have an idea that they could use some student support and student research hours to, to help advance. So. It's a great opportunity to help get students engaged in really applied community-based research. And there's a couple of important dates that you may all want to keep in mind if you're not already familiar with uh, because community-based organizations can apply for graduate student funding through this partnership fund. Um, and they would do that. The deadline has already passed for summer semester graduate assistance or research assistance, but June 30th is the deadline for the fall and October 30th is the deadline for spring applications and all of that information can be found online on the RSDP website. Uh, so, some of you may be familiar with where hazelnuts are kind of in terms of as a crop for the Midwest. 
If you're not, a little bit of background might be important here. Uh, I had mentioned that the development of hybrids has created a new potential market opportunity, and that is true. Um, there are, however, a number of limitations on the genetics that exists so far with those hybrids and with some of the attempts to develop cultivars from wild strains. Um, the biggest being propagation. Um, it's really, really hard to create a dependable hazelnut seedling uh, where of the parent plants. And so there's a number of researchers working through the Forever Green initiative here at the University of Minnesota with a real strong emphasis on genetics and propagation because without a dependable crop, it's a pretty big risk for farmers to take to plant hazelnuts. So with that in mind, why work on developing a market if you don't have an entirely stable crop uh, to work with? And in this case, it's kind of a chicken and egg situation. Um, one of the motivating factors for continuing to work on hazelnut crop development and for people interested in planting hazelnuts, even if they haven't reached that point of kind of perfect dependability, uh, is a good market for them. And so we're looking to try and creep forward with market development at a pace that that's in line with where current statewide hazelnut production is. So we do have a number of growers around the Midwest with a lot of plants in the ground and nuts that they're harvesting. Those need to go somewhere so that our early early adopters, early hazelnut adopters don't get burned out um, and lose faith in the crop. So through the Mary Page Fund last, last spring, I worked on exploring market potential for real kind of small um, market development Project. And what we settled on was interviewing chefs who may be able to work with much smaller quantities of hazelnuts, but are also probably going to be interested in a really high quality product. Uh, and then also talk to some landscaping folks and garden center owners about whether or not they saw some opportunities for using hazel hazelnuts. Um, so the interviews with chefs, there weren't many. I talked to seven people, um, but it was primarily folks in high-end uh, and local food-focused restaurants around the Twin Cities. A couple people who worked with catering services to compare with the folks who were in dine-in restaurants um, and brought in samples for all of them of hazelnut kernels, both raw and roasted, hazelnut oil, and then hazelnut meal, which is kind of a, a nut flour. Or it's the almond flour, and it's a byproduct of creating the oil. So if we can create a market for the meal, um, the oil itself is already a high-value product, and, and adding in an extra market for the meal that would otherwise be waste product um, could help improve the economic viability of a hazelnut crop. Uh, and the meal works real well as a, a flour substitute for a portion of flour in recipes. I, I haven't talked to anyone who's been able to replace all of the flour with pure hazelnut meal. Uh, so one of the things I asked the chefs and folks that I talked to to do was kind of rank their preferences for those different products that I had brought in. And one thing that surprised us was that no one was really interested in roasted nuts. In retrospect, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, they all have ovens in their kitchens, and they may want to roast immediately before using. There's some things like creating hazelnut butters where it's best to take the nuts right out of the oven when they're still hot after roasting and start blending them up right away. Uh, so the chefs wanted to have control over that, but there was quite a bit of interest in blanched and peeled, which was not something that I brought as a sample. It wasn't really something we were prepared um, to talk about with folks. The European hazelnuts and the ones that most people are getting from Oregon are generally coming blanched and peeled. And actually, if you go to any of your local co-ops, if they have filberts in the bulk bin, those are those European hazelnuts, and they're generally coming from Oregon. You can see they're usually pretty big, um, and almost always, they look like they don't have a peel on them. You can kind of think, think like almonds. They have almonds have that brown paper uh, peel on the outside, the pellicle. Um, hazelnuts are the same, and usually those are blanched and removed in hazelnuts before they're sold. When you're talking about the European nuts, in part because that pellicle, that paper coating, is fairly bitter. It's less bitter, it seems, in the midwestern hazelnuts that we're working with, and so we haven't been removing the pellicles, but there's a lot of interest in that. The major constraint, of course, is cost, labor, um, and, and what kind of processing equipment 
would be needed to do so. So lots of interest in peeled nuts, a fair amount of interest in raw kernels and oil as well, a lot of curiosity about hazelnut meal, but no one has really used it, and so it's hard to get people to say that they really like something they haven't had a chance to use much. Uh, everyone I spoke to, all of the chefs in the restaurants are currently using hazelnuts, so that's a good thing. They're importing them from out west, and most, actually all, would prefer to buy local nuts if they could get their hands on them. Several had heard of local hazelnuts but had no idea where to get them, and, and some connections can be made there, uh, connecting people who are interested with people who have a supply of hazelnuts and, and other products that they're able to sell. Um, only one person is regularly using that hazelnut oil. It's also imported. A lot of people were interested in it, but the caveat there is price, um, and they may not be able to buy very much. So there was a pretty strong, very strong preference for the flavor of local hazelnuts. I had a number of people head out to their pantries to compare the filberts that they already had on hand with the local nuts that I was bringing as a sample, and a number of people described their their filberts in the pantry is kind of mildewy or, or stale tasting, bland, especially when compared to the Midwestern hazelnuts, which were extremely fresh. Some of this may be due to storage issues, though, because most of those restaurants were storing their nuts in a pantry and not refrigerators, uh, and that's something that we would need to emphasis, emphasize to folks purchasing nuts really any hazelnuts, they probably should be refrigerated and it's going to help that freshness last a lot longer. Um, importantly, chefs were definitely willing to pay a little bit more for local nuts than they are paying right now. Uh, and that was reassuring to hear because as it currently stands, given processing challenges, labor uh, that's involved in harvesting hazelnuts and the limited supply, uh, frankly, people would need to earn more than what they could earn selling a European hazelnut right now. Um, there's a few caveats to all of this. One of them is the convenience of getting a product. Um, access needs to be really easy. These aren't folks who are going to have the time to drive down to Gaze Mills, Wisconsin, where the American Hazelnut Company is doing some processing. They need ease of delivery and access. Um, so they need to be able to know where they can find kind of a, a dependable supply of hazelnuts and to get that without having to jump through too many hoops. Um, there was also a really high interest in the sustainable aspects of hazelnut production, and most people were willing to pay more for that and felt that their customers are generally willing to pay more for a product that they feel is sustainably produced. And so there's... Um, a need perhaps in packaging and marketing around hazelnuts to emphasize things like soil water quality benefits that come from planting perennials like hazelnuts. Um, only one person was highly concerned about organic hazelnuts. Several of the chefs were very interested in organically produced hazelnuts, uh, but it wouldn't really be a deal breaker for them. And connected to that, there's a lot of interest in the story. People want to know about these hazelnuts. A lot of folks don't know that you can grow them in the Midwest. Um, they don't understand what it takes to produce them. And so hearing those stories, the stories of the farmers and the land that's affected by hazelnut production is going to be really important and absolutely is going to affect people's willingness to pay for hazelnut products. So finally, I had the really small focus group uh, about using hazelnuts with three participants, but it was a pretty good conversation, and, and we brought in a big tub of hazel shells and asked them to let us know what some of the positive and negative characteristics were and to kind of brainstorm uses for shells, which are currently a waste product, um, but if we could find an economically viable um, option for the shells, that could help bring down the price of the actual kernels or make overall hazelnut production more economically viable for farmers. So they liked the color and the durability of the hazelnut shells, that they're locally produced and that they're, they're generally a sustainable product. There's a good market for that right now in landages, 
which is why people are looking uh, at like cocoa shell mulch as kind of a sustainable option. Things like that are really taking off in garden centers. A uh, few negative characteristics though that they pointed out is that these shells are pretty heavy and are probably going to attract squirrels. They also are fairly limited in quantity. You know, it seems when you process hazelnuts like you get a lot of shells because about two thirds of the in shell nut ends up being shell. But there's still so few hazelnuts being produced that there's fairly limited quantities of shells available and that could be a problem if we were looking at landscaping applications in large part because if someone puts down hazel shell mulch one year, if they need to add more the next year, they want to be able to find the exact same thing. And if quantities are not dependent, um, that could be an issue for customers and as a result, a big deterrent for landscaping companies to start working with hazel shells. But they had a number of other ideas for things we could do with hazelnut shells. So I had mentioned that the Attractiveness to squirrels might be a downside of hazel shells. Well, maybe not if you're looking to create a wildlife garden. It could be a great mulch in situations like that where you don't mind having critters come in and kind of be among your flowers. Uh, there may be some pot potential for biomass, energy production. Not many people have looked into this too seriously because the quantity just isn't there. Um, a roadside mulch though, because the shells are heavier, uh, they could potentially be applied with the heavier equipment that's available to say MnDOT or other companies uh, or agencies doing some roadside maintenance. Uh, and similarly, because of that weight, they may be useful as a component in erosion control um, in those tubes that you'll sometimes see that are filled with, I don't even know what, uh, but maybe hazel shells could find a place in there to help prevent erosion on hillsides. Um, they talked about replacing rocks in planters or green roofs because the shells seem durable, but we don't actually know at this point quite how long they last. Um, and then there was the option of brown matter for compost. And this actually excited the three participants the most because they argued that brown matter is often what compost producers are looking for and need more of. And perhaps producing on-site compost where hazelnut are cracked and processed would actually be a big benefit for processors because you can market that compost then as containing local and sustainable ingredients, locally produced, and you might be able to have a higher value end product then um, by using the shells that way. So moving forward, that work was done just in the spring semester of 2015 with the Mary Page Fund. We realized they're able to do. And so with the help of folks at the RSCP statewide local foods group, um, we applied for a MinDrive grant and we're successful in getting that. And the goals of that grant were really to keep trying to advance industry development, um, or at least our understanding of what needs to happen in order to facilitate industry development for hazelnuts. Um, my own background is in working on community capacity for things like sustainable watershed management or forest management. And so this fits really nicely in. So what's the community capacity to support a hazelnut industry in the Midwest? Um, so I've been speaking with researchers, producers, potential growers, um, some potential buyers, and hoping to talk with some resource managers. Although there's not a lot of programs currently that offer a lot of support for planting hazelnuts. So resource managers um, haven't been quite as interested in sitting down for an interview. They just haven't felt like they've had as much to say. Um, some of the questions that I'm hoping to address are, what do participants know about hazelnuts? There's some concern that's been expressed that people are maybe getting a little too gung-ho about hazelnuts as a crop or maybe don't fully understand the issues of propagation and genetics, um, but are going ahead trying to sell hazelnut seedlings and things like that. So uh, what do people really know about the crop itself? Why are they interested in hazelnuts? Um, because that's gonna have significant impact on the direction of industry development. Um, what do participants think of the current state of hazelnut production and research in Minnesota? What kind of future do folks envision for an industry or for the crop itself? 
and then whether, where, and how participants find and share information or resources. So are there ways that we can help people connect with resources that are already out there um, to answer questions they have and don't know how to answer? So I have a few preliminary insights, and since this is the Natural Resources RSVP group, uh, I felt like this might be a good analogy. We're looking right now at people who are essentially the early players in growing hazelnuts, and it seems as though we might be able to think of industry development in similar terms to the way that we think about forest succession, going from field to mature forest. Uh, the folks who are growing hazelnuts right now are most most of them, not all of them, but most that I've spoken to are retirees. They have a couple of acres planted in hazelnuts, um, maybe less than one, up to just a, just a few, a handful of acres. There's a couple of larger plantings, people who have I think we might have lost Amanda there. Um, Amanda, you've got your audio? Quite sure what happened. This is really interesting. <laughs> um, as someone from Oregon, and I try not to be offended by the the negative reaction of people's um, flavor of the Oregon hazelnuts, um, but I can say from personal experience that I love using hazelnut hazelnut shells as mulch. Um, and on a path, they're a little bit pokey, but they're really beautiful. Like like she mentioned, the color is really nice. Dean, I don't know. There are a couple questions down in the chat box. I don't know if you can answer either of them. Um, are you familiar uh, with the specifics of the project? Of the hazelnuts? Um can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah uh, probably not. I think, you know, that there are restaurants that uh, have expressed, you know, interest, and Amanda would best be able to answer that. Um, and uh, she would be the one to talk to about that. And what was the other question, Rose? Uh, let's see. The other question is, uh, what scale of processing is needed for these near-term scale projects? Garden scale, larger? Yeah, actually, well, they have this, the Midwest Hazelnut Group, um, they have a processing facility. Uh, one of the interesting things is they have jointly purchased a, a harvester, and they use, uh, it's, it's a blueberry harvester, actually, that works fairly well. Um, so they've purchased that as a group, and then they share that. Uh, but, yeah, if, if you're getting to a scale beyond just individual restaurants, roadside stands, you know, farmers markets, then... Uh, you, you probably need some kind of a processing facility. Um, it, it reminds me, um, I was part of some conversations with, uh, with some folks in Crookston about a food hub, and folks were talking about the importance of having a processing facility um, in their local area to accommodate um, local growers. And uh, I, I just makes me curious if um, the kind of processing that Amanda was talking about could be accommodated at a, a food hub type um, community processing plant. Interesting. Yeah, and I, th uh -huh. and I think potentially, I know there's, uh, again, a lot of these folks that are growing the hazelnuts have gotten into processing and I think have, uh, you know, different scales uh, of, of processing equipment that could be used. and. Um, it would depend, again, you know, uh, when you look at the market, you know, can you produce enough to meet their needs and, and what level of processing would be required for that market? I do see Amanda on the attendee list, but having trouble making her a presenter again, so I'm not sure if we can hear her response. Thank you all for your patience. <laughs> this is uh, Connie Carlson. I'm. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Connie. 
Hi, I'm just sitting in, and I was. Um, I just wanted to let you know that there is processing uh, work happening at a food hub in Gay's Mills. So, um, where we had the hazelnut conference this last month, um, there is a kitchen that's been created um, at Gay's Mills. I'm not explaining myself very well here. But um, at that hazelnut conference, uh, they showcased some of the processing equipment that they are developing and talked a lot about, you know, the challenges of, you know, of the nut and cracking it and having passing through and how they're, you know, working with students to develop better uh, equipment and stuff. But the American Hazelnut Company is doing a lot of that there at the food hub in Gay's Mills. So there is a model. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Connie, for your for your um, addition. Yep, and I'm I'm actually working with Amanda. Um, I don't know if she's going to talk about this, but but um, we're also in the process of interviewing um, cosmetics people for the oil conversation too. So Amanda might talk about it, but um, I'm working with her on that part of the conversation. So awesome. Um, uh, do you have a response to this uh, first question? Um, from Gary, uh, if, is there a list of restaurants in Minnesota that will purchase hazelnuts from smaller growers? You know, I don't think that there's a formal list, but there are a number of restaurants um, in the Twin Cities that have been active partners on local food um, work. They, they've just been very committed to somewhat taking risks um, and uh, trying things. So the one that people always, always, always talk about is the Birchwood, Tracy Singleton. I'm sure Amanda interviewed her. That, that was probably one of the people Amanda interviewed. But Tracy has also, um, you know, incorporated. And her her chef is Marshall, um, and, and they've been also incorporated Kernza, and they've been longtime supporters of of the U of M work. So she's one. But then there, um, there are you know a number number of other restaurants um, that that can be approached. Um, but I, in long ways to say, I don't think that there's a formal list that's been compiled. Um, yeah, it seems like um, you all working with the with the restaurants and the growers might be the the connector at this point. Yes. 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 Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dean, for presenting. Thank you, Amanda, if you can hear us, um, for powering through your cold. Um, I'm sorry we got cut off. Oh, there she is again. Uh, as Amanda's getting situated, I do have a poll that I'll open up, and then we can come back to her for the end of her presentation. Um, so for those of you joining us on WebEx, if you wouldn't mind filling out these two questions, um, how much did you learn today, and uh, what content um, was the most useful or interesting for you? And again, this is as part of my AmeriCorps Conservation Corps of Minnesota and Iowa um, and Serve Minnesota uh, part of my uh, requirements. So um, short poll now, longer poll later. You can uh, find it either popping up at the end of this WebEx um, time or on the website uh, for the web webinars. Hi, Rose. This is Amanda. Sorry, we had a brief power outage here. Oh, no. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, Connie was able to chime in and answer some of the questions, but if you want to pick oh, up your... You, <laughs> if you want to pick trying. up um, your presentation. Oh, I don't even know where it went out. I just looked at one point and realized <laughs> I wasn't connected. Oh no! Um, you were. Uh, we were on the a few preliminary insights um, slide, and you were talking about uh, the growers, the demographic of growers right now. Um, okay, good. So I didn't. It wasn't going on for ten slides without being connected. <laughs> oh. Yeah, you can okay. share whatever whatever last thoughts you want to pass on. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I'll go ahead and, and just maybe wrap up by saying that there's a pretty, the people who are growing hazelnuts right now are playing a really important role. They're those early pioneers uh, with a really wide range of beliefs and opinions about where the industry should go. And they're trying a lot of different things. They have a lot of ideas, a lot of passion. And so finding a way to harvest that or kind of um, harness that and then bring it all together and direct it. You know, right now it's kind of energy and excitement and ideas are all over the place. And if we can harness that and direct it really constructively um, in maybe one or two directions to help develop an industry, it, it seems to me at this point um, that that's going to be really important. And along with that, looking at how we can try and promote some programs and policies that will support hazelnut crops in the Midwest as well as other agroforestry crops. Uh, because right now I've only spoken to one grower who used any kind of program, um, a cost share program in this case, to plant hazelnuts. And that grower planted them as a windbreak, and so it was a windbreak cost share program and is only harvesting maybe a bucket or two from the 1,600 or so plants that are growing out there, just enough to kind of have a hazelnut snack uh, for the family during the year, but isn't putting any effort into harvesting the nuts otherwise. Um, and so programs like CRP and EQIP, there could be some opportunities there, but as they're currently written, they aren't really supportive of the way that a lot of people want to manage their crop. Uh, so that, I think, sums up everything <laughs> that I was going to share. Um, and yeah, if there's other questions, I'm really glad Connie was on the call <laughs> and could respond since I was was off there for a minute. Yeah, we make a good. And she team. mentioned. Oh, she mentioned that um, there was interest in using it. I see you have um, on this slide uh, the non-food and medicinal use in in uh, like body care products um, or other things. Yeah. Yep. There's a number of people who are looking at the culinary uses for hazelnuts and just not seeing those as economically viable. Um, they feel like the filberts from out west are probably just always going to be a bit cheaper to produce than Midwestern hazelnuts, or at least in the short term will be. And so the argument from those folks is that we should be focusing on other non-food uses that may have higher, higher value um, and might help encourage more folks to get into producing hazelnuts. Um, there's a few, about a minute left on that poll. Um, if you are on WebEx, if you wouldn't mind um, filling that out, uh, those two questions to help me with my requirements for a conservation course. Um, and Amanda, the, the two questions that were submitted that we kind of um, touched on when you were out um, were about uh, the scale of processing needed uh, for the projects that you're talking about, um, whether mm -hmm. those are farm scale or larger, and then also um, connecting uh, smaller growers to the market of, of restaurants and chefs. Yeah. Um, and I'm knowing Connie, I imagine that she had some good responses to both of those. Um, I would say on the processing side, currently the American Hazelnut Company is trying to be a source where people can sell their nuts and the company based in Gays Mills will then um, handle the processing to make it more economically efficient. There's a number of processing steps involved in hazelnuts from husking to sizing the in-shell nuts, cracking them out, separating the shell from the nuts. Um, it's fairly labor intensive. One other option that I've been thinking about, and, and I'll think about this more as I continue with the interviews, is whether or not something like mobile processing units, similar to how some people um, will support processing chickens, um, a group may be able to kind of share mobile processing equipment so that not every farmer has to have his own husker. Um, and there may be some opportunities there, but I'm not sure yet. Awesome. That's, uh, that's really a big topic, those mobile stations, especially in um, the rural and a few and far between um, communities that are up here in the Northwest. So it's really neat. Yeah. Um, thank you, Amanda and Dean, for uh, your presentation. Um,
Again, tune in next time. Uh, our next arranged episode uh, is episode four. Um, I'm going to take back this presenter uh, ball to point it out. Um, the director of IONI, Jessica Hellman, will be um, presenting with us uh, RSDP project to be announced. Um, but that will be April 21st at 11 a.m. Um, same kind of deal. You'll be able to either call in or attend via WebEx. And yeah, please um, send me feedback either to my email, rmclark with an e at umn.edu, <laughs> um, or you can uh, fill out the the post webinar survey. Um, it will be under web web episode two, Hazelnuts and Landscapes. Um, so thank you all for attending. And um, Amanda and Dean, I'll I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Rose. Thank you, Rose.